Hello, friends. Welcome to Shred Radio. Waiting for Jess to join me live here. We're going to talk to Jess and Zoe today. So excited. <laughs> There she is. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Sideways. Can you tilt your phone? Yes. <laughs> I know Instagram sure. Live doesn't like us to do landscape. It does not. <laughs> I'm just gonna like do a little jobby here. Yeah, take your time. Move everything back a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. Does not like landscape. But mm -hmm. how's this? Does it like this? Beautiful. You look Good. great. Can hear you great. Yeah. Thanks, darling. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I was gonna Hi. keep playing some music, but my internet is like, uh uh. <laughs> mm -mm. How you doing? Yeah. I'm good. I'm um, I'm in the hallway of um, my boyfriend's parents' house because it's got the best internet. Hey. Yeah. Um, and so you know, it's really nice of them to let me use their hallway <laughs> to do this. Oh, yeah. But the internet so far appears to be holding up. Yeah, you look crisp. You sound crisp on my end. So yeah, we're good to go. Good. Cool. Thank you. An excellent Saturday night in the hallway in um, Heeson, Niedersachsen. Ooh. Yeah, everybody. So uh, Jessica's cur currently in Berlin, and uh, earlier I got to hear her speaking some German, and it made me really happy. So hopefully we get to hear a little <laughs> bit of German during the interview today. It was a language that I didn't realize could be so fun, but then I heard Jess speak it. So, oh, cool. When it's a person you know, it sounds awesome. <laughs> um. Well, if you spoke German, you would know that my German does not sound awesome. <laughs> <laughs> my, yeah. my accent's not too bad for somebody mm -hmm. with um, my level of command of the, the language, given the whole years of diction training thing. But um, yeah, I sound like a five-year-old when I'm talking. Cool. I love five-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> I see we got some friends joining us. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. This is a special intercontinental international edition of Shred Radio. So here in Charleston, West Virginia, it's noon, but where Jessica is, it's party time. It's 6 p.m., right? Tis. Tis. Saturday night, gin and tonic. Ooh. Real cucumbers. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Refreshing. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm being very well taken care of here. Oh, so happy to hear it. <laughs> hey, Eli, what's up? Cool. All right. Hello. Well, welcome, everybody, to the third episode of Shred Radio. Um, we are taking some time here at Shred leading up to our website launch. Hopefully, um, within the next few uh, weeks or months, we're really trying to make it ready to do what we want it to do. Um, but in the meantime, we're just kind of chatting with each other um, about how we came to build Shred, what we hope Shred will be. Um, and Shred really was something that emerged from a bunch of conversations that we had um, with our friends and comrades that made us feel really alive and curious and hopeful. And so um, we're super thankful to everyone who's interacted with us so far. Um, we've really had a fun time with our uh, soft launch stuff we've been rolling out. Um, most of that lives here on Instagram, so that's why we're also doing these little chats here on Instagram. Um, super excited to see what comes next and we're so happy that you all are here in this universe with us um here at shred we do uh take our nervous systems very seriously we like to take care of them when we can we do a lot of laughing uh we encourage rest and breath we try to adapt the pace of our work and the way that we talk to each other to sustain some calmness when we can um, and that helps our cognitive brain stay online it helps us stay curious compassionate and it helps us to be honest. Whenever we disagree, we can, uh, we can know that that's a safe thing to do with each other. So yeah. the basics of nervous systems are really just uh, take a breath if you'd like to. 
if you want to slow your heart rate down, you can always lengthen that exhale. If you want to look around the room, get your head and neck muscles moving a little bit. Look at the things in your environment that let you know that you're safe here in this moment. Yeah, if you want to do a little tapping, it feels nice. My favorite. And also, water is also great. Or gin and tonic. But the body loves hydration. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cool. All right, we've got some more friends joining us. Great. So today we're going to hang out with my dear friend, Jessica Azoni. And I think I first saw Jess perform maybe five or six years ago. It was at a venue. I think it was a snowy evening, um, really far north side of Chicago, dare I say, close to Evanston, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a really great venue. And then as Jess started to perform, I really became really entranced with what she was doing with her voice, with her body, with her face. It was one of those moments where I was like, wait, you can do that? Like, what, are, what is that that you're doing? And I couldn't tell if you were improvising or if you were like reading flawlessly from a score. And that's some of my favorite performances when I'm like, are you totally making this up? Are you out of control or are you perfectly in control? And so I think I will always remember that, that night as one of those breakthrough moments. Um, and especially I think seeing a woman do stuff like that, like women are not encouraged to be uh, weird or erratic or whatever. And so people like you, um, our friend Carol Janetti, other opportunities where I got to see women being intense and aggressive uh, and, and really expressive in a way that isn't just specifically uh, demure or like strictly <laughs> beautiful for the male gaze was really, really, really instrumental for me. So thank you for that moment. Um, really loved that. Um, and then as I've gotten to know you, I just get to be more and more excited about who you are in this world. Um, I think that you have like a really great character and energy. Um, you bring a lot of excitement to the spaces you're in and you're so welcoming and warm. And I think your fashion is impeccable. I love how you dress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that feeling is totes mutual. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so and then so this year also we've gotten to build a magazine together. And so I've gotten to know a little bit more of your, your deep mind, which is sharp and brilliant and also very kind, uh, which is the goal here, right, to help help be nice to each other in these, these rough times and to bring more um, peace and safety into the places where we experiment and learn together. Um, so yeah, it's been awesome to build shred with you, with you this year to see how you're thinking um, and, and how you want to use your energy as things develop as they have been developing. Um, and we've got, to have some, we've got to have some fun along the way, which has been great too. Um, so thank you so much, Jessica, for being with us today. So excited to connect with you across the ocean. Um, it's been- What an introduction. <laughs> it's that Leo, I wanna compliment all my friends. I'm like the cheerleader. I'm just like, you're so great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's important now, you know, we're, we're all having a lot more alone time than we usually would. And as a diehard extrovert who's used to having huge amounts of contact and lots of social pressure on me all the time, like, I don't know, I'm not shy about it, you know, we got to cheer each other on, you know, we, we don't have our public facing personas to do it in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of, of stuff around like validation and needing external validation. And I think it's like, yeah, we need connection. We need somebody to tell us that we're that we're lovely to be around. That's that's how we survived through the harshness that was our evolution. So happy to be connected. And it's cool that our our bands get to be international now instead of limited to a uh, one region. So that's great. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, and to be reminded of of who we are and these things that we have actually done in the world that made an impact. Like this story that you just told me that reminded me of a, you know, a particular moment in time where we were doing a thing and, you know, as a performer, everything I do is ephemeral, but the, you know, the result of these long trainings and histories where, you know, you feed information and you feed techniques into a body so that you can be both perfectly in control and, totally out of control and also simultaneously yourself and simultaneously present with the audience to, you know, do a thing that evaporates. Yeah. And then when you take that connective moment away, you know, that space of presency with each other, like we have right now, 
um, we have to keep reminding and reinforcing for each other why we, what we do and, and what's good about it and, and remembering all of these skills and trainings that we, we put into it um, so that we can stay open enough to keep building on it rather than, you know, let this stuff fall by the wayside amongst all of the trauma that is this year. Yeah, it's, it's very overwhelming. Okay. Are you having technical issues, Ruby? <laughs> well, I just realized I didn't have my headphones in, and that helps audio, and then my phone decided to fall off the face of the earth. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, important. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Yes. We're used to this. No, it's not perfect. It ain't no. going to be. No, casual. <laughs> but, yeah. I no, literally you. just had a an, – an, an, I'm in the hallway and there's a sauna outside um, and um, it's snowing and there was l literally um, a, a human being wearing nothing but a towel walking from the sauna uh, through my hallway right now. So I've turned the camera around so you're not going to see any of that, but I'm going to be waving occasionally to like sauna people coming in and out. Perfect. I love it. This is the beauty uh -huh. of working from our, our homes and our loved ones' homes. And you get to see all the weirdnesses that are people's homes. This is yes. totally normal in Germany, I promise. Cool. Hell yeah. I hope it becomes normal in uh, the United States. We all have community saunas everywhere. <sighs> yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. So yes, thank you for noting that um, it's, it's lovely to think about, um, you know, the times when we shared space before and the energy that, that that brings into these moments where we don't get to be together so often. So yeah, um, really happy. And we'll be together again someday. And uh, very much looking forward to that. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. Yeah. So obviously, it has been a really uh, intense first week of this new year. And I just wanted to take a moment to do a genuine check in with uh, how we're feeling right now. So how have you been feeling in your mental space, your emotional space, your body? What's up? What's up? Oh, wow. Thank you. Before I give my honest answer, I'm going to like take this moment to appreciate um, how wonderful it is that we have this reflex. <laughs> I've, been, I've learned a lot this year about um, how to engage with a more emotionally informed kind of practice, thanks to Ruby. And, um, you know, I'm the kind of person who sometimes struggles to feel my feelings, so I gotta, I gotta make myself do this. And even as I'm speaking to you now, I realize I'm, I'm taking this moment of talking about the practice, you know, <laughs> steal myself. <laughs> for sharing and being vulnerable in front of I don't know who's listening because it's very scary. Just friends. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, friends or no friends, um, my, myself, I'm the worst person to be vulnerable in front of. Once it's out, you have to admit it's out. Yeah. Um, so we have to help each other to remind ourselves of how important it is to do this. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I feel like all of my my basic and my secondary needs are well taken care of. I'm very lucky and I'm very grateful for the people I do have around me and um you know I feel like you know I, I'm very privileged sitting here where I am right now and I've got all of these trimmings of safety but I do not feel safe mm -hmm. <laughs> and I I feel really sort of wildly up and down and, um, you know, the current political climate and this just never ending uncertainty and managing this, this sort of ocean of, um, expectation and, and, and pessimism and optimism and pessimism and optimism and, um, trying to, Know, make a peace with decision fatigue and um, to to manage my own expectations um, to know that we can keep doing work and not expect it to pay off immediately um, and also to ride these these huge waves of, of political moments that feel so enormous um, and I just not have the words for it. Um, it's it, it's a hard time, I think, for for everybody. Um, it, on a on a purely practical, personal, boring note, 
it's not boring. Why am I minimizing this? Um, you know, my job is to perform under normal circumstances. And it's been now nine months of everything about that being either impossible or incredibly weird. And um, where I am right now has just gone into its strongest stage of lockdown. Um, on Monday, it becomes illegal to go more than 15 kilometers from your home and you can't meet with more than one other person. So right now, I'm like uh, at Christoph's parents' place um, so that we can see them before all that happens. And um, that every, every little decision that you make, it feels, it feels so heavy because you, you're potentially, if you, if you get it wrong, the consequences can be awful. Like, why is it okay for me to be here now, but not two days from now? But if, I, if, if we're not here, then that's like four months Christoph didn't see his parents and I haven't seen my family for over a year and, um, and I thought I was going to get to go home uh, to Australia soon. Uh, but I just found out the government cut the number of flights available in half. And as it is, there's a 32,000 person long waiting list to go home. And Goodness. yeah, so today it's been a hard day. I thought I had a flight, but um, the chances of me getting to actually do that you know, every day, it just seems worse and worse. And, you know, uh, yeah, I don't have as much control over my life as I would like as a huge <laughs> control freak. And um, that is really hard. Ruby, yeah. how are you doing? Yeah, thank you for sharing, Jess. Um, yeah, I feel I feel um, lucky that this year, by chance, I happened to move from Chicago, or I should say last year, back to Pennsylvania, where my family is. And so as the lockdown started, I, I was able to, you know, make sure my grandparents had groceries and, and check in, you know, with my, my friends and family and have some distance time spent together. Um, but it's definitely been hard considering that, uh, you know, a lot of people that I spent all of my time with for years are in Chicago. Um, and so just kind of reconciling with, like you said, every decision that you make is, is a big one um, and feeling grateful for the options we do have and also holding space for the grief of what we can't do, um, especially whenever we really in these moments want to connect with the people that we know and love. So, yeah. Um, I think right now I'm feeling pretty good. I uh, have Blueberry here to help me, <laughs> my little <laughs> comrade here, my furry friend. Um, but yeah, I think it's been obviously a very intense uh, week here in the United States. Um, when I got word of what was happening at the Capitol, uh, I took that in and then I immediately uh, had to hold space for a loved one who was having a a bit of panic and I was really proud of myself for being able to do that. Um, so I think this, this week, while it's been scary, has built even more gratitude for um, the opportunity I've had to learn about how valuable um, calm and connection is, especially when things are chaotic and unexpected, and how um, our culture really tells us that if, if we're not freaking out, then we're not doing enough. Um, and so uh, I hmm. think that there's, all kinds of people doing really important, urgent work. Um, and I might have considered myself one of those people in my previous time when I was organizing. Um, and, and it's been very interesting to feel what it is to be like, actually, I'm doing very different work now. And it's very important work. Um, and so sitting with that tension of like, I should be doing something else versus this is what I'm doing. And I, I'm doing it because I saw the relevance because of what I was doing before. So but yeah, living in the learning and the growing and, and very thankful that I have um, a place to live and food to eat and water to drink and a, a kitty to snuggle. So that's how I'm feeling. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. It, everything feels real urgent. But then we have to remind ourselves that like, life is actually long. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> a lot of, lot of change and, and, and new things are possible that are outside of our control and we put so much pressure on ourselves to make everything happen right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the performance amongst us um, is like a total <laughs> reflex uh, yeah. to, to just accept that we have to sit with time. I mean, this, is, this feels like such a cliche right now. This is yeah. literally the whole world figured this yeah. out this year. It's a yeah. tough lesson for me. Yeah. 
Well, I'm happy that we got to connect uh, throughout this year. Um, and I'd love to just kind of hear a little bit about um, what 2020 has been like for you. Um, I know up until now, you were traveling a lot, like all the time. Um, and you currently live in Berlin uh, after living in a lot of different places throughout your life. So I guess um, I'd like to hear a little bit about what it's like to live there. Uh, and, and then again, how, to, how it's been to navigate the pandemic there. Um, I know a lot of the people that are watching now are based here in the United States. And so if there's any differences that, that might be interesting for us to hear. Um, and yeah, then what's sure. it been like for you to be in one place for a long period of time compared to jet setting all over the place? <laughs> Tuts. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was like the poster girl for neoliberal global citizenship. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there were periods of my time where for months on end, I was changing continents so often I did not get over my jet lag. Mm. Um, and this is this very strange thing that has become normal in my line of work and, and it, not, not just normal, but like some sort of, uh, I, I've now sort of had some time to reflect on like how incredibly fucked up it is that this is some reflection of um, your success in your industry, um, that you're, uh, you're so mobile. Uh, I love feeling like I'm part of this broad sort of anarchic interconnected web of people from different places and with different experiences and, and different fields. I, I love this. Um, but this, this feeling of kind of floating above rather than um, putting your hands in, in the earth and trying to make real things happen and feel like the community is a place where you can do things rather than just drop in and out of. Um, this, this, this year, being in one place mostly uh, has just, it's like the dial on that that sense of desire to um, be able to not just make things that are ephemeral, but to make, be part of something that affects real change in, in real lives and to be connected to people um, and community that has, um, that has really, the dial has really turned up on that this year. Mm. Um, yeah, you had so many parts to that question. I'm trying to remember yeah. what the other parts to the question were. So, so, so that's a, that's what's been like to stay in one place. What's it been mm. like for that place to be Berlin? And what about the pandemic oh, yeah. in Berlin? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, so, if you'd asked me like six months ago, I would have said, um, well, you know, people in Germany they just trust their government a lot more. Um, so like everyone's following the rules, and um, the rules like at the beginning were really strict, and everyone I knew followed the rules, and we dealt. You know, our numbers did not go up and everything seemed to go right according to the book. And then this fatigue set in. And I'm as guilty as anybody of feeling really tired of this situation. Um, and you got tired of feeling scared and you people started to operate really differently um, under the under the rules and to put pressure on their, their governments to make different kinds of rules. So yeah, I think we were doing really good. Um, you know, there is an actual scientist who is the boss of the government. Wow, what? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, like the, the chancellor is a, is a scientist, and you know, when she speaks about things related to science, such as preventing um, the worst possible outcome in a pandemic, people tend to take her seriously. I think most people uh, still do, but it's a um, you know, this, this situation here has really brought out a lot of ugliness um, and we're seeing, um, we're, we're seeing far right radicals doing, um, trying, coming into cities, trying to do harm and um, parts of the country where nobody will wear a mask. And I wish that hadn't happened because I felt like it was such a feel good story at the beginning, but then... Um, you know, people, when they get ground down and they're really struggling, uh, it, it tends to bring out the worst in people. So Berlin, you know, Berlin is doing pretty okay. Um, where I live, the numbers are not insignificant. 
um, but we've had really clear rules to follow all the time, everywhere, um, and the rules change according to the reproduction number, you know, uh, <laughs> based on where we're sitting from week to week, things change. And yeah, it's been hard, I think. It's been since October now that people have been allowed to gather in groups, for mm. example. Mm -hmm. um, Christmas uh, was a maximum of two households and five people. Um, and same with New Year's. Uh, so just, I think it's been quite different. We've had a different experience um, in Germany. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, the rules actually really help because you can um, – They, they give you a clear guideline to work around. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to be constantly taking responsibility for every life or death seeming decision. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, that helps to take the pressure off a little bit. Um, and it helps to, you know, not totally hate the government. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, it's, uh, it's, I'm sure it's a different flavor of relationship there and then here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, that sounds, that sounds intense and also, um, yeah, very different from here. Um, curious if you have performed it all this year and what that's been like. Sure. Um, I have done four performances since the pandemic began, um, which is a lot more than some people have gotten to do um, and a lot less than I would normally do. Uh, and it felt like, like a, Each one of those is so amplified in its memory and its meaning and its relationship to place um, and to see and its relationship to audience, like what it means to be on the stage with the people who are watching you. And I've paid so much more attention to that this year, like how that relationship is shaped by, by place as, as well as like the, the cultures around the spaces where I perform, which are very varied. Um, like one of the performances I did, This year it was in Tokyo at the National Theatre of Tokyo in a 2,000 seat theatre in a show that involved 300 people to make the thing happen. And, um, you know, when you're, you're part of a big machine in that situation um, and you have to have uh, rules and organization to make that machine work. And I got to see a lot about I got to really feel in my body and in my habits that I had to develop while I was there, lots of things about Japanese culture that I might not have absorbed otherwise, like the, without the consequences being quite so heavy. Mm. Um, and by the same token, you know, I did performances. Uh, there's a, a venue in Neukölln um, in Berlin, like an experimental music venue um, where Jesse Marino and I run a small series called Worst Behavior. Um, that's much more experimental um, and much more free and small. Um, and that sense of community and being together while less regulated, like that one show that we did, um, I don't think I've ever felt more like really real and with my audience. I mean, it felt like a sort of, collective outpouring of, of grief and joy at the same time. Uh, yeah, I hope I can, I hope I can hold on to that feeling like that memory of what it means to do an ephemeral thing with people um, and how important it is to really try to be with them. Because sometimes it, we get so in the practice of doing the thing that we have been taught to do. Mm -hmm. And to rely on reflexes and habits and, you know, producing that, mm -hmm. um, that you're not having real conversations with people. And this time has, has really taught me how important that is. I, I want, I want that so much in my life, whether or not the actual artistic practices, the, the artistic products are reflective of that politics, you know, aesthetics and, and politics and philosophy don't always meet. Um, but creating spaces where you can be together as a community in a way where you feel like you're talking to each other to do something together. Um, that is a priority that um, has gone way up the list through this experience of the pandemic. Oh, that's beautiful. We're definitely hoping to somehow make that possible with Shred digitally as well. So 
Yeah, Let's exactly. <laughs> savor that feeling, yeah, and see if we can get the robots to help us make it happen. <laughs> um, so I'm just curious to hear a little bit about um, how you came to do what you do. Like, what is your origin story, and how does one become an international opera performer? Like, that's a interesting career, and I'd love to hear how uh, somebody from Australia came to be, uh, you know, doing what you do. Ah, uh, sure. Um, yeah, I grew up on a farm. We had horses. Um, uh, my, my dad, um, was a welder. He made farm gates. Uh, wasn't exactly, uh, your typical classical music upbringing. Mm -hmm. Um, and through some, um, I always knew I wanted to be a singer. Like when I was four years old, when people start asking kids, what do you want to do when you grow up? I like literally told them I'm going to be a singer and everyone thought that was hilarious given where I was. Um, but I, I just um, kept trying. Um, what do they say? Like if you want to learn to do something complicated, you know, muscle memory or what, um, motor learning, you, you keep trying random things until something works and you keep <laughs> building on it. I think that might be a short way to describe how I, how I ended up in this position and then approximately in my late teens, the, I, I started to um, be, build an infrastructure that allowed me to learn the stuff that I needed to learn. I went to college, um, a, a liberal arts college called Victorian College of the Arts in a city about an hour from where I grew up, Melbourne, and met beautiful people there. Um, my, some of my best friends and collaborators still are people that I met um, in my teenage years at this college. And... Yeah, I think that's, that is how I ended up being a person who um, makes conventional opera and also all of the weird stuff and has the kind of uh, critical practices that I do. Being part mm -hmm. of a, a community of people who were critically engaged and um, prioritize creativity and supporting each other in that practice. Mm. Awesome. Cool. I'm so glad that it happened that you landed in Chicago at the same time that we did and we got to intersect. That's, that's a fun little universal uh, friend making connection. <laughs> oh, dude. Me yeah. Too. Yeah. Um, so, so, so one of the things that you did with your uh, abundant energy, you're one of the more energetic people I know, I think, and especially this year, um, is you decided to build shred with us. Uh, and like the rest of the steering committee, um, you were on board with this project before we realized this should be a magazine. We were like, how do we talk about what we're experiencing and get more people involved in this conversation and kind of uh, generate more shared analysis so that we can take action? Um, mm -hmm. And, and at, the t you know, at the beginning, it was a lot of conversations. It was, do we write about this? Do we make a animation like what do we do what is this and then yeah. you're like oh it's a magazine because we need mm -hmm. to have a lot of people involved we need to build containers um for these kinds of conversations with these guidelines um yeah. and so i guess i just want to know why did it feel important to spend time uh, a lot of time <laughs> on this project this year yeah yeah um well <laughs> i mean i was i had this lucky experience like just talking about this now I got to be from an early age, part of a community because the conditions existed that allowed me to do that. Um, I just saw a comment, uh, well-funded public education. Exactly. I got to go to school without debt. Mm -hmm. I got to go to a good school. I got to go to a school that prioritized um, learning across disciplines and where I was able to learn skills and techniques at the same time and alongside absorbing a whole lot of different kinds of knowledge that you know, allowed me to make my human self a container for training and, and training myself and a continued openness to allow it to be a site for experimentation rather than um, a, a machine for making a thing that, that already existed. And um, I get to live this life. And if there was any other time that I was going to make an investment in trying to figure out how I could make that kind of luck more accessible to other people, a pandemic and having all my performances taken off the table 
I mean, if I didn't do it now, it was never going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just, I feel so lucky that I had this experience. Um, even it doesn't actually exist anymore. Like this, um, this more sort of liberal part of the education of the school that I went to, it was, um, it was defunded a few years after I finished there because it was fun. It, the university was swallowed up by a larger university and they wanted to pack more students in to bigger classrooms and not do this kind of um, interdisciplinary, uh, not, not create these spaces for, for thinking broadly and for influencing each other without an objective. Mm, mm. Um, you know, you can't sell it, um, but without it, you know, life is just a, a series of exercises towards making products, and that is very dissatisfying. Um, and, I mean, you and, and Eli and so many of the other people that are part of our team, I mean, we're all, we've been lucky enough to have the time and space to, to reflect and to figure these tools out for ourselves and... Um, a magazine seemed like a really good place to do that. You know, I've been writing about some of this shit in the ivory tower and that's all very nice, but, uh, it doesn't get read. There's so much research about how to make art and how to be, uh, how to think critically and, uh, develop your interdisciplinary skills. Um, and it's nice. I learned a lot, but, uh, I wanted to be in this moment in a place with, you know, my hands in the dirt, um, mm-hmm. where you could actually talk to people and do shit. Yeah. yeah. If not now, when? Yeah. That's one of the things I'm really excited about with shred is as I think academics become more disenfranchised and realize like there's no, <laughs> there's also no stability for you necessarily. <laughs> um, it's time to exchange for, uh, academics to share the resources and information they have and to learn from folks who have been shut out of those institutions Um, because there is, uh, a lot of echo chambers all over the place. And so, Uh yeah, um, very excited to kind of direct, um, that, that, that the time that people have had to reflect because of privilege or luck or whatever, uh, into cultivating spaces where there can be a healthy exchange of information and ideally, uh, organizing to change the material reality of our world. Uh Um, yeah. So, um, <laughs> it's a, it's a task. phrase organizing <laughs> to change the material reality of our world. Oh, wow. What's that? <laughs> it came out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. And I think, um, something that I've been realizing, uh, as, as shred has kind of just been a process developing is, um, Part of why Shred happened is because we got a, a fellowship from the Center for Story-Based Strategy, um, and I'm a trainer with them, and uh, we had a little convening uh, right before a shutdown happened out in San Francisco, my first time in California. It was great, and we had just a little uh, week-long, uh, you know, time spent together talking about, um, you know, how to do what we do, how to h- help people uh, strategize to tell stories um, that can move organizing in the direction of a a just future. Um, And in that gathering, one of the goals I set out loud is I want to organize artists who aren't already organized. Um, I'm part of an art collective. I have so many friends who are organizers and artists who are at their capacity. The, the, The need for art to speak about what's going on is so much greater than the capacity that we have as artists who are also Um, you know, doing the work on the front lines. And I see in my life a lot of brilliant artists who are like, wow, this is bad. What do I do about it? And I'm like, we need to organize you. Like we need your labor to go in a, in a useful direction. And so it feels very helpful for me to be connected to somebody like you who has uh, you know, uh, your, your hands in a lot of different worlds and you have a really interesting perspective and access to all kinds of institutions that I don't even know about. Um, and so I'm like, cool, let's use your connections and I'm going to build with you and we're going to expand into these crevices of people that haven't been putting their energy towards these material changes yet. And I think that's really exciting. Um, and when I, when we started Shred, I didn't remember that I had said that, but now that I'm looking back, I'm like, oh, that's what this is. This is a way to organize artists who are not already plugged in. So mm-hmm. very And excited. I was not, you yeah. know, I, I was, you think about things and you talk about things, you know, especially mm-hmm during this pandemic, you know, lots of talking, lots of long Zoom discussions about the kind <laughs> of utopia we would like to live in. Um, and 
spending time with you and, and learning some of these skills, learning about the, the methods that have been developed over many thousands of people and tens of thousands of hours spent, you know, developing techniques that are every bit as sophisticated as somebody who's trained in classical music, for example, to organize speech and to help people figure out how to articulate what they need and, and how to get there and how to get your message out. And I didn't, I had no skills. I still, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just at the beginning of this journey, but it's like a big curtain got pulled up watching you do what you do. And, and it's changed a lot of things for me when I'm, when I'm in spaces with other artists um, thinking about how we can make material change, how we can organize for better conditions, how we can organize for more transparency, having the, having the confidence to, um, to talk about and the language to talk about some of the inequalities that, um, that I encounter um, in my work within this industry. Um, I mean, I can only speak for, for artists, but you know, we're, we're all really scared that if we rock the boat, we're going to lose our jobs. Um, yeah. And, you know, if we don't get better at talking about it and working together and, and moving as a community, then nothing is going to change. Um, mm -hmm. And that means, you know, building inclusive communities where nobody feels locked out because they, you know, practice a different genre of music or they don't have enough degrees or they're at the bottom of the pay scale. Um, you know, that, that's really important. A lot of, uh, like contracts in, in, in my field, at least, um, have gag clauses. We can't talk about the pay discrepancies. Um, you know, it's just like a, a, basic, a basic example. Even, you know, with companies that get their money from governments, and, and I think this is so incredibly wrong. Um, and this is one thing that, you know, I can occasionally do something about. Mm -hmm. um, and when we work together we can develop a few skill sets that are going to make this, uh, yeah, solidarity seem good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't have to, um, everybody's afraid that they have to reinvent the wheel to get something done or that they have to, um, they have to chop off their, their own hand um, in order to, you know, be a martyr to a, a cause that won't work. But th this is, there are people who've already done this thinking um, <laughs> uh, and I'm trying to learn. I want to learn. I want to be part of this process. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's all just a big exchange and a big process and we're growing and learning together. <laughs> cool. So on that note, I'm really curious if you can just tell me a bit about um, the philosophy you hope to work with in the context of shred and why as um, a person who does all the things you do, you're a performer, a teacher, researcher, writer, awesome human, um, you like to party, all the things that I'm into also, uh, you know, why do you think it's important to get people engaged in these kinds of conversations we're trying to frame with Shred? Mm -hmm. um, sure. I know it's a big question, but. <laughs> Such a big question. Well, we've already talked about some of it. Um, yeah. I am a human who does a work where most of my work is contained in this human vessel. Um, I'm really concerned with how I live in my body and um, how I live with, how I work with other people's bodies in, in community and developing habits and practices where you can feed and nourish that body with new information and to sort through and shift through these enormous um, vessels of, of prior information that we hold and to acknowledge it. Um, and to have reflexive method mechanisms that allow that old knowledge to be sifted in light of new knowledge. Um, and that, you know, your, your body is, is also a tool to operate in the world um, and to try and affect change. And that means that you have to be open to change, to change yourself. Um, staying open requires training. And this is a form of training in being together and in learning new practices together and to receiving new information from different kinds of sources that we can access from within our own disciplines. And, and Shred seems to be doing that for me. And I hope that through all of the different events that we have planned, 
and the trainings that are being run and the articles that are being written. Um, I, I hope to make that more possible for, for other people. I know I have learned so much in, in these last six months of spending actually a considerable amount of time um, <laughs> on this project. Um, but I feel quite, quite changed by it. And I, I hope to be part of a, a space that helps to make this kind of philosophical dynamism, to create a dynamic space um, for other people to kind of access it hopefully a little bit as much as I have. <laughs> yeah, and can uh, you I can't talk. This is just terrible. I, can I just, I, I want to put it out there. I'm, it's like I've forgotten how to talk to people. Are you all feeling this? <laughs> I, I lose my own train of thought. Um, I'm, I'm currently like in a house with three people, which is the mm -hmm. most people that have been around for a while. And it's so exhausting trying to figure out how to talk. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... If I, if well, I remember, remember, remember that the <laughs> remember that the mammal is also taking in all of the sensory information. If you need a breath, if you need whatever you need to feel chilled out, you're good. I love hearing you There's talk. There's a skill I learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Ruby, everybody, Ruby, Pinto. <laughs> take the moment, feel your feelings, <laughs> be present. Don't have I... to perform all the fucking time. Mm -mm. Which I literally learned this year. Uh, yeah, it was, um, oh, right, I have a body. Oh, right. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> this this, mm -hmm. this part, the, the meat suit. Okay, hang on a minute. <laughs> Let's yeah. see what this one needs. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, luckily for me, this is, it's like the, the body is always the thing. I literally take parts of the inside of myself, project them into the air. They vibrate. They go inside another human being. They mean nothing until they are manifesting as meaning inside the meat chamber of another human. Mm -hmm. This much I had, you know, fully imbibed. This is my practice. And mm -hmm. then what happens when you can't go inside another human and, and, what happens when all of these reflexes you develop to be useful are not very useful anymore? What does my meat chamber know how to do that um, <laughs> can contribute something without the other people to go inside? Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people who did some thinking about that before I got here. It's been nice to learn. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's I mean, literally our whole history as a species and beyond, literally back to our cosmic origins have something to do with what's happening right now. So that's something to keep in mind. <laughs> We're doing great is the point. <laughs> For real. <laughs> All things considered with the chaos we emerged from. We're, we're great. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to hear just a little bit more about the, um, the kind of, the kind of, uh, I think we phrased it as, you know, the difference between um, the material reality of culture and politics and those practices versus the aesthetics. Um, and anything mm -hmm. you have to say about that, because I think that's part of what we're trying to um, gain language around and gain context around here with Shred. Yes. Um, so uh, a lot of people who work in the arts, myself included, um, spend enormous amounts of time trying to make the aesthetic outcomes of the work we're doing and or the methods we use in the making of the thing to reflect our politics and our ethics and our um, the philosophy that we're interested in and that is totally nice and worthy um, but I have definitely been guilty of um, and I've witnessed a lot of work that gets stuck in this where um, you know your desire to manifest these things aesthetically is shaped by your experiences and your knowledge and your really specific place in the world and your specific language sets and reference points. And um, it's not translatable. You're not speaking the same language as the people in the audience. And sometimes that's nice. Like, I don't speak Italian. I love going to see an Italian opera. I don't need to speak the same language for it to do something to me. Um, but if what you're interested in is translation and making material change, um, making some sense of real, uh, you know, touchable difference, trying to locate exclusively your ethical and philosophical um, reason for being 
in the aesthetic outcomes of the work is a losing game, I think. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Um, so, you know, I am able to feel... I, I'm trying... I, let me figure out how best to say this. I accept myself making art that isn't a full and whole realization to the best of my ability of my politics and my ethics. Sometimes I want to do that. Sometimes it's okay to make art because it is pleasurable and pleasure is important and you hope to share that feeling with the audience. There are, art exists for many, many different reasons. It doesn't change the fact that I want to live in a more just world and um, I believe in developing techniques for increasing um, freedom and creativity in the bodies of the members of my community. Like these kinds of concerns are still real, whether or not the aesthetic outcomes are more concerned with category A or category B. But if we only locate the work in the art itself, then we're losing a big part of the picture. Um, and getting involved in, in something like Shred, I think was really important for you know, just giving yourself permission to try to get more real about it, even if I don't have all the skills, because I'm pretty good at singing, relatively speaking. Um, really not good at um, uh, being an organizer, not a skill set I have, but um, doesn't mean I don't have other skills, and skills are translatable if you, you know, take new knowledge in. So that's what I'm trying to do with it locating the politics outside of the art, sometimes inside, but allowing myself to try to learn the new things and to be vulnerable in that space. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I, I, yeah, that's why I'm so excited to have you on our team because it's just so clear that you, um, you know, you know how to gain a skill set. You know what I mean? I've watched you learn how to build a website in the last three months. <laughs> And so to see somebody weirdly, with such... everyone, I'm building the website. <laughs> so it's weird. a beautiful website, yeah. And so to, yeah, just to see somebody like you, with who's help. like, okay, Not alone. yeah, yeah. Oh, I have with nothing help. alone. Oh, yeah, uh, nothing without community. Um, but yeah, to, to see somebody who's like, okay, I know how to teach myself this really complicated piece of music. I know how I learn. I know how to teach myself and how to teach others and how to, you know, and and just to say that in and of itself is a skill. You know what I mean? Um, I have a degree in radio and I thought I would never be using that degree. I graduated do, 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 and I was, do, do, do. yeah. <laughs> and I was like, Oh no, I'm going to use it. I just had to organize or whatever for eight years to have something relevant to talk about. I couldn't fathom saying, you know, I'm just going to get a job at clear channel and uh, you know, it, it'll be fine. Uh, no, I actually didn't have much to say uh, until I went through this other cycle of learning everything. And now uh, but but I was I used my uh, radio skills, how to uh, publicly speak, how to convey information in a spoken form convincingly, how to engage your audience. So useful in organizing. Um, so that's the thing is that it wasn't like, oh, I wasted my time getting this degree. It's I got this skill that I, you know, I'm in an incredible amount of debt for with this private art college I went to. Uh, they're not getting that money back. That's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, so I have that skill and I left that institution thinking, what am I going to do with this? And then said, well, what's important to me? I need to help. Mm -hmm. I need to be improving the world. I need to be freeing my people. Um, and so I'm just going to do that and follow that course. And now here we are. And, um, you know, I definitely don't think that this interview series is going to fix the world. What it's going to do is hopefully connect the dots with people who have a lot of skills that are really amazing um, and help them funnel them into the project of making the world a better place. So super excited to hear um, your perspective on that and to share that with you. Um, and uh, on that note, what are you most looking forward to creating with Shred and how is that going to help? How, how is what we're doing going to help with that vision? Mm. What am I most looking forward to creating? I'm really looking forward to some of the events that we're running. You know, everything's online these days and um, there are going to be training sessions and 
online participatory art pieces and digital web art, um, place, finding new ways to, given our current situation, like get into it together and to be together, even across the ocean. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, you tell there's a theme, I like people, yeah, I'm extroverts. <laughs> <laughs> I started to feel really bad um, about how apparently uh, we created a world that was like really well set up for extroverts and all the introverts are like, yay, I don't have to see people like Jess anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, I miss my friends. <laughs> um, who am I? Anyway, <laughs> who am I? Uh, yeah, so having a space to do that, I'm really looking forward to. I am looking forward to having a space where I can talk with people from different disciplines, uh, talking to organizers and talking to scientists about how to share skills and solve problems together. Um, we're we're going to get messy. We're going to um, kindly and compassionately talk about some hard stuff where we're not always going to agree with each other. And um, I I think we have put in place some fairly extraordinarily robust practices for containing that kind of conversation um, in a in a kind way. And I'm we've been trying it out on each other for the last six months and I have found it transformative and I look forward to like bringing more collaborators and contributors and you know general public into this kind of a space because it's it's been very transformative for me. So I, I look forward to seeing what happens with that when we can, through text and events and participation, apply that, that, that model to see if we can solve some shit together. Yeah, that's exciting. Wow. Well, um, this has been awesome, thinking about big picture, everything that's led you to this moment and how we got connected with you and what Shred is becoming. Um, back to the now, back to the body. What are you doing to take care? Uh, I know you said that stricter lockdowns are coming uh, tomorrow, um, and uh, you know that's a, that's a, a mental uh, thing to deal with as well as physical and emotional. So I'm just curious what you're doing to take care of others and yourself throughout this rest of this winter. Mm. Yeah. Um. I am the annoying person in my friend's text message feed. I'm doing a lot of check-ins. Um, I want to feel connected to people as much as possible. Um, just make sure everyone's okay. That is important. In order to make sure that I'm okay, I'm doing like a lot of exercise. Exercise and like in a, in a kind of constructive way, um, I'm trying to take control where I can, draw my boundaries um, so that within those boundaries I can, I can have some freedom. I know, for example, I'm not happy if I do not have structure, so I have to draw clear boundaries around work time and work objectives um, and then not feel guilty over just letting myself feel my feelings and be a blob at other times. <laughs> so I'm doing fairly concentrated forms of specific exercise and um, trying to take some of the decision fatigue away by putting in boundaries, um, which is a privilege in itself because, you know, I'm not like living in a one bedroom apartment with three children. Um, I have a lot of choice right now. Um, and I recognize that that is a, a particular privilege, but I also am trying to be kind to myself and realize that it just being alone in my studio apartment is driving me completely insane. I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm being alone all the time is very, very hard for me. Um, so yeah. And letting that be okay. I wasn't built to do this. None of us were built to do this. <laughs> this is not a normal time. It is okay to not be okay. Just trying to come up with some goddamn ideas to keep ourselves safe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to hear that you, you have that choice and that you're caring for yourself and others. Um, and I, I don't think that it's annoying to check in. I know it feels like it can be a lot, but I think that's a muscle that we've all uh, been developing this year of how do I make sure that I am checked on and how do I check on my friends? And uh, and a big thing that I've been thinking about this year has just been consent. Like, um, how do I consent with myself that I'm ready to care for somebody else 
am I checked in enough with myself to know that I can offer space to somebody else? That's the first part. And then Mm. do I ask how somebody wants to be cared for and how does it feel if they say no? Uh, How does it feel if they say yes? And I realize I can't sustain that. Um, So all of these things of these layers of consent um, and getting our needs met while also acknowledging that everybody kind of needs more than anybody can give. I think that was like a meme that I, or a tweet, you know, everybody needs more right now than anybody can give. And just, remembering that guilt and shame and um, stuff like that, they're there. And, and, you know, that's, that's part of how we operate mentally. And also there are other ways to feel about how we are managing this moment. And so Mm. I'm happy to hear that you, that you're taking care and and checking on your friends. That's, that's really wonderful. Um, Yeah. Anything else to say before we sign off, Jess? I love and appreciate you, Ruby. And oh. it's just, I always come out of these conversations feeling so much better. That is the <laughs> thing that I'm doing to take care of myself and others at the same time. Just making the commitment, doing a thing, big thing, a vulnerable thing, letting yourself go down the rabbit hole of something that seems like it's worth doing. That's an act of simultaneous self-care and community care. Absolutely. I love you lots too, Jess. Thank you so much for talking with me today. Um, thanks thank everybody for joining us. Yes. <laughs> thanks everybody so much. I think we've had some friends come in and out throughout the hour. Um, this conversation will be up on our Instagram live feed, our IGTV, um, you know, and you can find, I already talked to uh, Eli a few weeks ago. I talked to Emma a few weeks ago. Um, be talking to the rest of our steering committee meeting uh, committee members in the coming weeks um, so we've still got to talk to Jack, Patrick, Clara. I think that's it. Um, and then somebody's got to talk to me so that I can talk about myself, <laughs> which I love to do. Super important. <laughs> um, and then from there, Shred Radio is going to be whatever it needs to be. We might have steering committee members interviewing other people. We might have one-offs. We might have all of us together sometime. We might be moving from Instagram Live to a more uh, nuanced uh, kind of broadcast system at some point. Um, But until then, find us here in the future. Uh, This chat will be up in just a minute, and you can re-watch, share with your friends if you'd like. Oh, we're happy to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Shredmag.com is our website. Right now, it is a splash page kind of talking about what we're doing and why. And if you're interested in getting involved with Shred, you can scroll down to the bottom of shred-mag.com and there's an interest form. And there you can put in any information you'd like. Um, We'll get a little email. Um, If you've done that already and we haven't reached out to you or if we reached out to you and then stopped, it's just because we have a lot of folks involved and we're doing our best to, to keep this sustainable. We love you so much. We're building out a way to plug all these pieces in. Um, and so if, if you feel that we have not gotten back to you yet, uh, we will. Um, and please feel free to hit us up again if it's urgent. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, soon our main website will be up and we're really excited about that. Um, if you uh, want to give us a little bit of money, if you love us a lot and want to financially contribute, you can become a patron, uh, patreon.com slash shred magazine, um, everywhere from the $3 a month tier to $100 a month. Um, and there's gifts along the way. If you want to give us a $3 uh, donation a month, we'll send you a button. Um, at the $10 tier, you get a handmade custom space necklace made by me. I would love to make a necklace for you. Um, I should be wearing, I, I wear your necklaces all the time. I just realized I should be wearing it right now. I, what an oversight. I <laughs> know uh, the same thing happened with Emma. And I was like, I don't know why I'm not wearing it either, but someday we'll get it. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's all kinds of fun gifts. And just so you guys know that money goes to kind of, uh, you know, building and maintaining our infrastructure. And also we want to pay artists. Um, and if the artist themselves doesn't want the money, uh, we can donate it to a mutual, mutual aid fund of their choice as well. So, um, yeah. And our definitely. contributors would be yeah. really lovely to be able to pay people to do that work sometime. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So patreon.com slash shred magazine. If you'd like to, um, show us a little financial love, um, 
And uh, yeah, basically we will um, we will be up and running this year. We're so excited to see how things develop. Uh, we'd love to work with you. We'd love to be in community with you. Um, and for now, signing off Shred Radio. Thanks, Jess. Hope you have a great rest of your evening. See you. Bye-bye, friends. Bye.